So, hi everybody. My name is Igor Souza. Uh, I have a little bit of uh, more than 20 years experience in the area. I work currently, I'm a software engineer in a data engineer team. And I have the privilege or the, the luck of working in the big data and in Hadoop since it starts. So I have big experience in these areas. And today, uh, uh, actually at IGFS Souza, you can find me also so on networks. Follow me on there. I will share the presentation on the end. You can uh, came with questions or get in touch. So today we are going to talk about unlock data intensive applications with virtual threads. Uh, I will talk about a little bit of a history in a kind of a data engineer perspective way, what happens in the last 10 years. I will try to do a comparison between Scala and Kotlin in that sense. And then we are going to, to see how Java implements coroutines or what is coroutines, what is Project Loom, how virtual threads works, and then how you can do uh, applications that is data intense by itself, right? Despite I'm going to talk about threads and virtual threads and coroutines, it's kind of a, a simple way to understand. It's a simple talk anyone can follow. It's nothing special. And on the end, I hope you guys are going to understand that is a kind of simple, cons simple concept and it's easy to implement. And then hopefully you guys can go and play around and do some tests and find out and understand more about this. So Let's talk about a history, right? Like, uh, let's come back. If you look at 10 years ago, 2013, big data was in the really trained. Everybody was talking about Hadoop. Hadoop was starting, Spark was starting. Everybody was talking about map reduce and processing. 2018 was previous to Java 8. Java was not able to do streams because the streams was released 2014, Java 8. So majority of the projects of that time migrate to Scala. So Scala was a functional language, really mature in that, in that point of time. Everybody was trying to do map reduce in a simple way, in a fast way, in a functional style paradigm. And then majority of the projects from that time, right? Kafka, Spark, Flink, you name it, right? There is loads of others, especially in the data engineer area, right? Data intensive. They, they started on Scala and then they grow in Scala and they did things like that. And then after a while, 2014, Java is created the Java 11, uh, Java 8, bring the streams. People realize, oh, now we have streams on Java, so we might don't need to migrate to Scala anymore. And after a while, people will stay on Java. And of course, Scala did the other things that kind of kill a little bit the, the training. And then if you see the, the training after five years, 2016, for now, Scala is falling, Java is still there, right? And then what I'm usually to joke, right? What I'm saying is the same is happening with Kotlin nowadays. So if you back four or five years, you see that Kotlin is still growing, especially of in the in the area of uh, data intensive projects, right? So Kotlin is growing, uh, especially Kotlin with Ktor and Micronaut. They are growing, 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 and people are migrating with Kotlin. Not because it's just trending. People are migrating with Kotlin, especially in the data intensive area, because Kotlin has a, a mature implementation of coroutines. And then Java doesn't have until Java 18 that it came as preview. And now on Java 21, we have as a default. But still, there is loads of things to improve, loads of uh, uh, things that is not a possible to do it yet. Let's see the future, right? So. The joke or what I'm saying, like the history is repeating itself. What what happens with Scala 10 years ago, now is working, it's happening with Kotlin. And then Java starts this cadence of six months releasing, new functionalities. So in that sense, we hope that people will realize that now it's possible to do data intensive applications with Java. So I don't need to migrate to Kotlin and those kind of things. Of course, there is odd, several other things that uh, uh, contribution for why Scala grows and why Scala de die in a, a little in that sense or the same with Kotlin. But of course, I put in my vision as a data engineer, my vision in, in the data intensive world. So it's kind of my bubble, right? I'm, I'm forcing that uh, vision here. So yeah, as I said, right, the, the history is repeating itself. But let's try to understand what is coroutine, what is data intensive and what, what is Java is doing, right? How I can do this in Java. So here is, I put the architecture of a generic application. You can see here that you have a front end, doesn't matter the technology. It's running in a Kubernetes or a Docker, right? 
controlled by a Kubernetes. You can have a, a backend framework, could be anyone, and then you have a, a Kafka cluster. The application can write and read from Kafka. This could be a kind of infinite loop. You can have several microservices that sends to a Kafka, writes again, goes to another Kafka and writes again, or doesn't matter if you have Kafka or not, right? It can be microservice. Then you have databases and type of NoSQL database or object store or persistence or layers, whatever. And then that's the 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 application, right? But uh, imagine yourself that uh, you someone uh, ask you to build an application that is need to receive loads of requests per second or thousands of millions. How you do it? How you create an application that enables a web application, right? That enables to to handle thousands of requests per second. So one of example is the American football, the Super Bowl, right? Is one of the most uh, views uh, sport events in the worldwide. So I got some information from Google. I don't know like the the rise of this data, right? But uh, the last year was around uh, 110 millions of views worldwide, and they end up with uh, around uh, uh, 7k requests per second. So. I, I I usually to joke, right? I run on 400. So can I create a web application that uh, handle 100,000 requests per second? Can I? Can I do this in Java? How I do it? That's what I'm trying to, I'm going to try to answer in this presentation, right? So if you think about a, a web application scenario, right? Imagine I have my application. Here is kind of a, a cart example or a, a buy and sell stuff example. So I have my web application. I need to call an external REST interface or external API. It doesn't matter what it is. This interface or this API is going to retrieve some JSON. I need to do some manipulation on this JSON. I'm going to retrieve it. Imagine I receive, I send an ID of a product. I receive a JSON with information about this product. I manipulate the JSON. I get for information about the price, and then I I update my database with the, the the new data and this price. So, if I need to do this a hundred thousand times, it's okay. I can do it in a sequential way. It's going to take a while, but it's possible. But imagine if if I needed to do this more often. If I receive I don't know ten requests. Simultaneous requests, right? Imagine if I receive 10 simultaneous requests, how I can do it? Or if I receive 100 simultaneous requests or thousands of simultaneous requests, hundreds of thousands. And then can I receive 10 simultaneous requests and stop, nothing happens? Or I can receive 10 simultaneous requests, but in the following second, one second after, I receive another 10. So imagine if I receive 10 simultaneous requests, for one minute every second. Or if I receive hundreds of thousands of requests for every second in, in kind of a, in a windows of half an hour. That is exactly what happened on the Super Bowl last year. On the end, like the application was for vote, right? For vote, what is the best player on the game? So people was watching the game and able to go on a website and vote for who I believe that is the best player in the game. On the end of the game, they end up with 4.5 billions of votes. Was kind of average of 3.6 millions of votes per minute. That uh, came something about 70k, thousands of votes per second. So imagine a web application receiving 70k requests per second during the uh, average, right? A game of a football game is kind of two hours. So in a windows of two hours, you're you're receiving loads of requests. That's the the idea, right? There is several ways to do it. So first, if you increase, if you know what is a web application, right? You, the web application creates some threads. The server creates some threads. If you get, for example, a Spring, use Tomcat as the full. Tomcat as the full has two hundred threads. So you you up to two hundred threads, you can receive two hundred requests. The 201 is going to wait one of those start, stop and then it's going to be answered. Of course, you can increase the number of threads, but then you're going to lost, uh, end up with no memory. Another way to do it is going to the reactivity way that you, 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 you fire and forget and you go in a synchronous way. 
and then you don't care about this. But in that sense, again, you spend more memory and your throughput increases a little bit and you need to learn a lot of paradigm, a lot, a lot of frameworks and things like that. And then the way to do it is virtual threads, right? That I'm going to explain what is. So basically in the scenario, right? I have a thread, I receive the, uh, I, I call the REST interface, then my, my thread is going in a block stage, you know, a waiting stage because it's doing now all. Once I receive the data, I update my price and then I save in the database. Again, my thread is going waiting and then blocking I O. So in one and three, my CPU is idle. My thread is idle, is not doing anything. And then and the other is running. So the way to, to fix that is using coroutines, right? Hello? I, I block? No. Yeah, so using coroutines. So coroutine is an old concept. It's from 1958, so it's more than 50 years ago, 60 years ago. The idea of the coroutine is divided in subroutines. So we have small routines that you can uh, schedule them in an easy way. There is loads of different flavors or loads of different ways to implement coroutines. Until Java 18, Coroutine was not implementing Java. Coroutine, there is Coroutine is implementation in different languages, several languages, right? In Kotlin, it's one of the most common, most uh, implementations. Uh, so that's why in data intensive people use it to go in Kotlin. So Java implement in a kind of a fashion, and they call virtual threads. So a simple explanation of virtual threads. Because now we have the virtual threads, we usually to call platform threads. So platform threads is the, the the old thread, right? And then you can create loads of virtual threads that are those arrows, like subtasks. So what's happened is you get one of the tasks and you put on the platform threads and this thread is executing. Once this thread goes in IO states and is blocked, I remove that thread, the, the simple thread from the, the platform thread, and I can get any one of this, this list, right? And start using. So in that sense, my platform thread is never I/O and never uh, idle anymore. And then when this thread is finished, this virtual thread, I can come back for this list, or I can mount again in the thread or in another one, right? So it's a simple way to understand what is virtual thread. So if you think in a sequence, right? So you have the client that do a request for your database or your server. The request goes in the database or whatever, and then you have the results. Those, those things takes a while, the thread is blocked. So in that sense, if I have one request, goes a query, if the query takes, I don't know, two seconds, for example, if I have my second request, this goes in another thread, right? The, that, that thread is blocked, so I need a second thread, and I can, my database is blocked in that sense as well. So. With virtual threads, I can do things like that. My server goes there. I call the query and then I come back because I remove the, the, the virtual thread from my uh, platform thread. So in that sense, the same thread can receive the second request and then and so on. So with less threads, I can answer more things and then I have better throughput. So virtual thread is not about uh, speed, it's about throughput. So I have better throughput. So it means I can receive more requests per second. So if I want to receive thousands of requests, I can have more requests with less platform threads using just the virtual threads. So in that sense, I create a way to make able my web server is going to receive more requests per second and it's not going to end up with end of memory or broke or corrupted stage, right? In a simple way to understand is I have loads of virtual threads that is mapping on uh, just a, a little bit of numbers of platform threads that is mounted on the top of the OS, right? So if I have a CPU with a four core, normally I create four platform threads, one for each core, and then I have thousands or millions of virtual threads, and then they are mounting and mounting on top of those four threads. So I can have hundreds of requests, thousands of requests, millions of requests per second. Nowadays, you, if you Google, you find people that already create millions or thousands or hundreds of thousands of virtual threads in a machine. And then the joke is, we don't care, right? The number of threads, we care about the throughputs. Like 
I can I can have millions or billions of uh, virtual credits in simultaneous ways, but how I I schedule them, how I manage them, how I use it then in my web application, right? And then of course Project Loom is the implementation of coroutines in Java. If you like it, there is different ways to implement and. And then you can have a look on the JEPs itself. So we start with JEP 425, and then 444 is virtual cred, is the full one Java 21. And then there is another JEPs, right, that goes under the uh, Project Loom umbrella, if you like it, that is the structure concurrency and extension local variables. And then it, that's how they are trying to implement the actor styles or the uh, back pressure stuff. There is no, no, not a, a definite way or implementation way to do it yet, but they are working on. Or fingers crossed that they are working on. There is loads of scenarios with uh, virtual threads that is still a little bit of pro problematic, but they are working on. And hopefully, in a few releases or in the next one year or so, we are going to see something more mature, more stable, more able, and then. People will avoid or people will think twice, right? I don't need no, I don't need anymore move to Kotlin if I work with data intensively because now Java has a kind of mature implementation of coroutine that we call virtual threads. And then if you really, really want to understand, this is my suggestion, right? Go against the the basic concepts, right? Forget about what is Java, what is Kotlin, what is Scala. Go against the, the, the base concept. So coroutine is the concept. As I said, coroutine is really old concept. Fiber is continuation, generators, search, go on Google, search these words, try to understand. There is loads of exp explanation about what is coroutines despite uh, the language, right? As I said, there is implementation of coroutines in different languages. Go, Scala, Kotlin, now in Java, uh, .NET, JavaScript, Python, whatever, right? Try to understand the concepts, try to understand how it works, why Java choose that implementation that is more or less based on fibers, how they, they choose the name virtual thread, why, and those kind of things. And then the idea, right, is what I said, like you have the, the thread or the color, and then you suspend and resume, suspend and resume until everything is finished, and you're happy, so you still that way. Of course, the structure course and the local variable is still in preview. There is loads of space for improving, loads of things that is going to happen, and they they are going to increase and brings the project along, right? The coroutine implementation in Java in a more mature level. In that sense, you can use it and in in a better throughput. And then, what's the the benefits, right? You have a very lightweight and few uh, k bits. K bytes, right? Compared to one megabyte threads in the old style, the platform threads, you you don't block, do not block the underlying thread, right? My thread is not in in IO uh, IO stage, IDO stage, right? I don't need to learn new APIs. I can use the same old APIs and things like that. And then uh, I don't. There is several other benefits and I don't need go in the nightmare of working with reactive way and thinking it's an asynchronous way and those kind of things. I don't need to learn new APIs and so on and so on. And then what I usually to to say, right, is the best way to understand is go ahead and, pr and pray, right? Here I put the uh, Spring logo, but it could be any framework or do it what you, whatever framework you like it, right? Or if you don't like it, do it without framework, but try out, play around. So, for example, if you follow the Spring, right, go there, create a Spring Boot application, try to do a test, do uh, some 10 requests simultaneous. As I said, the Spring by the full has uh, 20 thre uh, 200 threads. So create something as a test with 201 threads and see what's happened. Then you do the same, try again, create again another project and use the Spring Web Flux. The Web Flux is going to go in the reactivity way. And then you try with the Spring and coroutines. As I said, coroutines here, you can go in Spring uh, virtual threads, right? The last version of Spring has the last version of Tomcat that is more mature in that sense. And then they have framework implementation of virtual threads and seven implementation of virtual threads. And you can try. And then try to check the throughput. And then that's the way, right? You can have a producer and a consumer, someone sending data, 
create a basic controller and do a test and play and see what's happened, how easy and how difficult it is and what's happened and how you do. And you're going to realize that the most difficult parts of that thing is not create the virtual threads itself. As I said, there is people showing how to create billions of virtual threads. Is doing the test is the difficult part. So how I can prove that I have thousands of hundreds of thousands requests in a simultaneous way. You can use JMeter, you can go with Predator, you can go with other tools, K6 and things like that. JMeter has a limitation that you can go up to 10K requests per second. So in that sense, if you want to do 20, you, you need two machines and things like that. And then, of course, I, I was uh, checking the email group or email list, and there is already efforts to implement virtual threads under the JMeter. So in that sense, JMeter will be able to do more requests per second. Predator is a really, really nice tool, create kind of a cluster of Kubernetes nodes, and then each node can fire hundreds or thousands of requests. You just need a better uh, loads of machines. I play a lot with Raspberry Pi, so I have my cluster of Raspberry Pi. Every machine starts and things like that, but it's still, there are some limitations, right? Your network and things like that. Of course, you can go in a cloud provider, so you have uh, the pro two problems here. One is if you start several nodes on the cloud provider, and try to request your network. First, you need to open your network, and second, you're going to explode your uh, network provider, right? Uh, you're going to receive too much requests, and your net uh, your Wi-Fi at home is going to, to fall, right? The provider is good. You can do the opposite as well. You can have the application on the cloud provider and start several nodes at home. For example, as I said, I have, I don't know, 20 Raspberry Pis calling my application that is a provider. The provider is going to say, look, there is probably a bot somewhere trying to do a denial of server here and they're going to block. And then uh, hosting this application in a cloud provider is going to be really, really expensive. And then the K6 is kind of a, ja a JavaScript framework you can do. So that one, you can go like it almost up to 50, 60K, uh, requests per second, and then you can do some validation on throughput, uh, I don't know, up to 100 users or 10 users in a one minute windows, and then you calculate the, the throughput you can do. Of course, there is loads of other test tools around for doing metrics and things like that. As I said, right, test is the difficult part, how you prove that you achieve that number of requests. And then... Once you solve the website parts or the web applications, you're going to see that the database becomes a problem because now imagine your application able to receive hundreds of K, uh, thousands of requests per second. Now, what you imagine if for each one of the requests, you need save on the database, right? They are voting on which was one is the best player. So I need persist this on the database. So my client gets the request, my threads receive the query, and needs persist on the database. But because my database takes a while for persist, the second request not able to write, and then I end up with the same problem. So how I solve this? I solve it on the web application. Now, how I solve in the database? Of course, there is already initiatives of adding virtual threads on the JDBC driver, adding virtual threads inside the database and things like that. So in the future, when everybody implements virtual threads, everything is going to be kind of in a nice way, right? So one way to solve this is the R2 DBC, the reactivity way to use your JDBC driver. So you can send the request and fight and forget, right? A synchronous way, you send the request, you don't care about if it's right or wrong. And then in that sense, the thread is not blocked and not idle, and then you can do it that way. Another way to do it is using the data streams, right? There's loads of data streams applications. Kafka is one. KSQL, uh, KSQL DB is one of the options, right? You don't use a database. You write on Kafka. Or you write on a KSQL database. And then after a while, you can persist that thing in a disk or can persist this in an object store on a Hadoop file system. And those persistence parts could be sequential ones, so you don't care. You, the data is not going to be lost. You just need the guarantee that the data is on Kafka and then you save, right? Of course, if you want to see the results 
in, in a faster way, right? One thing is my application received the votes, but I don't care about the result. I just want to see the results once the game is finished. Then once the finish finish, I can have like 10 minutes for uh, process the latency, right? And then I see the result. But imagine that I want to show the partial of the, the votes on fly. So my I receiving how hundreds of requests per second, but I want to show like whatever is the, the the values of the votes on fly, right? So it's not about only receiving the request, it's about processing and showing something. And then the stream is the best way to do it. You can have a windows and summarization and aggregations on the Kafka side, and then you show which are the players that has more votes or the number of votes and things like that. Another options are on the right side, right? What we call a stream database. There is loads, I put those two that they are more common, but there's loads of other variations, implementations and things like that. The idea is similar with Kafka, right? You you send the data, you guarantee that is right on the stream, kind of in memory stuff. In one moment, they are going to write on the disk and they are going to persist, but you, it's kind of a black box. You don't care. It's everything it's safe. And then you have the micro stream as well option uh, that is kind of a stream, not a data stream, right? Just a stream like a Java 8 streams. And then you can add elements on that thing. And that thing is staying in memory. Once a while, he's going to persist. Doesn't matter how it works. It's a black box. And then that's safe. Of course, micro streams has some limitations regarding uh, concurrency, right? If you have uh, hundreds of users writing that thing in simultaneous way, there is still some limitations. You're going to end up, if you talk about thousands of hundreds of thousands of requests, believe me, you're going to end up in that limitation. So those are the things that you... Uh, you should take uh, be aware, right? But as I said, like the future, right? It's they are go. They already started to implement virtual threads on the frameworks, uh, Elidon, Micronaut, Quarkus, Spring, you name it, right? Vertex, all the famous ones. They already start to implement virtual threads on the server, Tomcat, Jet, Net. Uh, Elidon uses one that they call the Nina, and so on and so on. Those are the things. You have virtual threads implemented on the framework side. You have virtual threads implemented on the server side. Now they are starting to implement virtual threads on the database side. So virtual threads on the, under the JDBC, the connection, virtual threads under the database. And of course, we are going to see virtual threads under Kafka or Spark or data uh, batching things as well. And then the, I use it to joke, right? A data stream is kind of, you have a producer and consumer, but it's kind of a, a memory, uh, you, you can call array, a pipe, or whatever you call it, right? A sequence of elements that you can append new elements and keep this forever. And I, I, I have a patch project that yeah, I try to explain uh, data structure for kids. And one of the ways to see this is a lead stripe, right? A lead stripe is a, a nice and a fun and a, a better way to understand what is a data stream, a sequence of elements. So imagine every time that I receive a new element, I can turn on and turn off the lights and I can explain this in a easy way. So I can have a different colors and can turn on and turn off and you can understand how I add elements, how I read in a sequence. If I have an index, if I stop, I start from that index again and then things like that way. So. What's the future of Java, right? What's going to happen? As I said, Java 21, almost three months ago, was released. We have virtual threads as uh, users ready. We have instruction currents and uh, external local variable. They are previewed. There's lots of things to change, lots of things to improve in that sense regarding how I do back pressure in Java, how I do the actual model, how I, I scale, and how I increase my throughputs. Those things are still to come. Uh, another thing is the virtual thread. Uh, as a normal majority of the developers, right, when they develop a web application, they don't they don't need to create the the thread itself, right, the platform thread. Normally, the framework do it or the server do it, so they use in a in a black box way, right. So the virtual thread is the same. Once everybody implements the virtual threads, you you're not going to end up creating virtual threads in your application. The framework, the server, the JDBC or the database are going to do it for you. So you're going to have the benefits in a transparent way. That's the future. Another thing is, as I said, there is already a lot of buzz, a lot of trending 
of virtual threads on free nodes. There is a lot, lots of training on virtual threads on server. They already start to talking about virtual threads everywhere, right? As I said, on JMeter, virtual threads on the JDBC, virtual threads inside the database, virtual threads inside Kafka and Spark and other technologies around. And then the other thing is, if you if you think about the corporative way, right? The Jakarta E, they have what they call the Jakarta currency. Three one is going to be released on Jakarta eleven. That is maybe April, March, April next year. And then what they are doing is they are implementing or they're forcing a way to implement virtual threads on the servers. So that means that in six months' time, majority of the servers are going to run against implement virtual threads. So more servers are going to implement virtual threads, meaning your application are going to handle more requests in kind of in a easy way in a simple way because you're not going to do anything. The server is going to do everything for you. So in that sense, end up you you don't need even know what is virtual thread because the server is going to do for you. Right? So the the idea is that the the applications are going to improve the throughput in a simple and a transparent way. So what are the, the takeaway here? So focus on the basic concepts, right? Go there, check what is coroutines, what's fibers, continuation generators. Try to understand the concept, forget about the language. By any means, I'm here to talk about uh, language A is better than language B. It's not my point here. It's, it doesn't matter what language, right? The, those languages have some limitations. Java usually to have some limitation. Now is working for fixing that problem, especially in the data intensive world. If you check uh, I3E or, or JetBrain or uh, all the other reports, you're going to see that uh, Scala grows up to 2016 and then falls. There is loads of other uh, points why, right? But I'm forcing that was because of the Java recovery. And then you're going to see in the last five years that Kotlin is just growing, 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 especially in the data intensive application scenario. So the question is what's going to happen in the next five years? Is Java is going to recover from this because he has a better cadence of increasing and going to, to add these functionalities. So you're going to be a better throughput and spend less memory. So you, in that sense, you don't need to go to Kotlin. That's the future, right? It's going to be nice to see it and understand what's going to happen. But that's the point, right? Try to understand what has happened, how it works, the limitations, focus on the on the basic concepts, right? Forget about the language. Once you understand the concept, you can apply in different languages and frameworks and so on. And structure currents and extended local variables is the two JEPs. 428, 429, they're open, previews, status, there's lots of things to came, more to came, right? And hopefully the implementation of coroutines in Java is going to grow and it's going to achieve a more mature level. And then I usually to always put a call to action in my presentations, right? The call to action is now you understand the concept or you have a, a better understanding or better vision of what is coroutine, why Java in, implements that thing what you can do it with, right? So go there and try, like, as I said, I put Spring here as an example, more popular framework, but you go with without framework or with your framework of your choice, doesn't matter. Go there, try to use it, try to play, create a normal application with normal Tomcat, normal uh, platform threads, see are the limitations, create a kind of a controller that receives the request and uh, wait five seconds and then return. So try to create uh, 10 requests in simultaneous, 100, 200. What's happened once you pass 200, that's the number of threads. Then grow for thousands, 10,000 and see what's happened. You're going to end up without memory. If you create more threads, you're going to uh, uh, explode the memory. Then try the, react the reactivity way, see how the throughputs improve and then try with virtual threads and see how improved. Of course, here you can do in a simple way, just an application, you, you can really uh, com do complex things with uh, Kubernetes and things like that. IG, FI, Sosa, you can find me all social networks. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed my talk and you learned a lot of things. Feel free to ask questions and get come and follow me. Um, with that, I just want to thank you and uh, I open here for questions. I 
was not looking for the shot, so I'm looking now. And uh, I have a question here. So I, I will, you, I'm going to publish the slides and everything. Just follow me. You're going to see everything. You, if you go on my my sites, you can find out lots of uh, similar examples how to play. I normally do lots of things with Kafka. In the last, uh... so Alexei asked how JVM detects and understand which virtual threads could be paused and remove it from platform threads. It's when when you go in the blocking stage or I.O. stage. There is more than one way uh, how, uh, why the thread goes in blocking stage on I.O. stage. So if the block gets in I.O. stage, meaning uh, the block is waiting uh, uh, a REST interface or another server to answer, or is waiting persisting on GISC, or waiting the database, or waiting for something, right? So in that moment, the thread is in uh, idle stage so it's not doing anything so when that happens the virtual the the jvm now remove that thread the virtual thread or the subtask from the platform threads and mounts another one and once that thing finished he he puts on the list again and stay this so in that sense the virtual threads not in idle stage anymore so with that you you have more throughput more you handle more things faster. Uh, I'm going to stop to share, perhaps, or I live on that page on that uh, slide. You, you can guys can get my information. I just want to have visibility of the shots here. Yeah, I have. So yeah, feel free to came with questions. And uh, I hope you guys liked my presentation. I gave you an overview, a brief overview, right? What is data intensive world and what is the the things that you can do it and the limitations that you have and why one language has more traction than the other in that sense, in that world, right? In that bubble. And uh, the idea that is with the six month uh, Java cadence, Java is going to be uh, recover that sense or it's going to to be with a better uh coroutines or virtual threads implementation more mature level and people are going to use java in the data intensive world uh, so dragon really nice presentation thank you i hope you like it thank you uh so as i said right go there try yourself it's not about uh, creating a code that is started thousands of millions of threads. This is really easy to do it. There is loads of examples, right? It's more about testing, how you validate those millions, thousands of uh, of threads, right? Creating the threads is not a problem. <laughs> how you use them or how you validate them, right? And then once you you solve this, the server or the, the web application problem, you're going to have the pro with the same problem on the database. So you need fixing in both sides how you handle the web application, how you handle this database size, the, that size, right? And that's the, the things. Tobias M say, thank you for the insights. Yeah, I hope you like it. As I said, follow me on social network. Feel free to ask questions. I'm going to share the slides and everything should be okay. Yeah.